Hello and welcome everyone to Be The Wellness Podcast, episode number 10. Having a hard time with our title tonight. Yes, not Be The Episode. <laughs> Adam, Adam did the first go of welcome to Be The Episode. <laughs> yeah. Yes, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we are getting pretty excited. It seems like we're getting into a really nice groove in the Unveil Your Wellness tribe. And you can feel the spring is that spring is here. Everyone's starting to just be in a better, chipper mood, and it seems like the energy is really lovely out there. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. <laughs> sun's out, guns out. <laughs> so we did not have a ton of questions this week to go over, but what we did have was a couple of questions that sort of all fed into a bigger spectrum of subject matter. So Adam and I are going to talk a little bit about loading and what it means to look at loading potential, what kind of weight we should be lifting, what that means for muscle propensity and all of that good stuff. And uh, hopefully you guys will, you know, get a little bit of light shed on how the program is structured and, and how we recommend adding weight and what your weight should feel like in each workout and all that good stuff. So let's get started. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, I guess it makes sense. I think we, we've kind of talked about a little bit of this stuff in, in a few other um, contexts maybe, but with the changes in workouts and stuff, it, it's, um, it's coming up again. So that's, so that's cool. Well, just another way to talk about it all. Yeah, absolutely. So the, f- the first question we had was about using weights, and the person was asking if their lightweight dumbbells were heavy enough to elicit the kind of response that they were looking for during their workout. And, you know, the answer is sort of a yes and no answer, but we wanted to dive into why it is yes and no and how you should be thinking about weights within the context of each workout. So oh, go yeah. for it. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, you know, are these dumbbells going to be heavy enough is, is like Vanessa was saying, it's completely dependent on where you are in your journey. So if you are, we'll just, we'll use the contralateral dumbbell deadlift as a, as an example, because it's one that, um, you know, requires a pretty light load, but it's, it seems like you should be able to do it in any case. So let's just say that you have, you know, a a relatively light dumbbell and you can, you can barely do a contralateral deadlift with it, even though it seems like there's no problem. You can bend down and pick up a five pound dumbbell, but you can't necessarily do a contralateral deadlift, um, with, with nice, good form with the whole thing. Is that, you know, is that five pounds enough weight to get the response? And and the answer in that particular case is like, absolutely. You know, if you can't get through the range of motion, then there's, there's a lot of motor control issues and stuff like that going on there. Right. So you may not be building massive glutes and hamstrings from using that five pound weight, but that weight is definitely something that you should be lifting in as uh, from like a skill development, proprioception, motor control perspective. Right. So there's a yes answer, you know, so yes, the, that, that weight's plenty and probably you shouldn't progress until you can, until you can really nail that on the flip side, if motor control all works really well and that five pound dumbbell, you can, you can bang out all four sets of eight without really even feeling any sort of burn or whatever the, the, the particular um, set rep scheme is without feeling fatigue, then no, it's not light enough. Or not, not heavy, heavy enough. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, obviously any bit, of, any amount of stimulus is going to be great, but at some point it's going to start to be a little bit negligible. If you can just bang through your sets and, you know, you're barely even breaking a sweat, then at some point you're sort of just doing a warm up. So, you know, obviously we're not here to tell you you should load up a ton of weight and, you know, every set should be barely grinding it out, but there should be, a, you know, a sense of, this is work to get through the the sets and you should be feeling a little bit of burn on everything. Yeah, totally. And if, if you, um, I mean, it kind of like what we've discussed before with the, the, when should I progress from one body weight movement to a more complex body weight movement? And there's, there's just kind of this spot where, you know, we're, we're all trying to avoid these high volume sort of chronic cardio or, or, um, repetitive motion kind of things where we just have to do a ton of volume you know, in order to elicit the adaptation that we're looking for. 
the, the way that we reduce the volume is by in, increasing the intensity. And when we're talking about the strength and conditioning stuff, increasing intensity usually means increasing the load. And so that's just kind of the deal. You know, once, once you've mastered a range of motion and all of a sudden it becomes easy, then the next thing to do is to, to challenge that position again by increasing the load. Right. And, and so the question then becomes, so do we just keep increasing loading forever? Is that, you know, that's, which is a totally valid question. Right. Do I just add five pounds a week for the rest of my life? (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. What is the deal? So there's, there's kind of two different, um, well, there's a lot of different schools of thought, but they actually all sort of break down into two basic categories. There's this idea of linear, uh, linear progression, which is just like it sounds, you, you, just continue over time to add small incremental amounts of amounts of weight. So kind of a rule of thumb that um, you'll see in a lot of programming is that for lower body movements, like say a deadlift or a squat, you'd want to add 10 pounds a week to whatever it is that you're doing. And for an upper body movement, um, like a standing press or a bent row or something like that, you'd be looking at five pounds per week. So that's a, that's a pretty standard linear progression model. And people will do that for three or four weeks and then sort of back off maybe just uh, like a 70% kind of a deload week and then hit it again with that linear progression. And and it really, it, well, it's incredibly boring, but it just works. You know, and, and the thing about linear progression is that it it's the most simple thing that you can do. And so you want to do it until it stops working. Because this is the thing about the body is that it, you know, eventually you're going to run out of tricks. That's why you see professional athletes doing all of these crazy programs, you know, like all of this different stuff, because all the basics stopped working on those people their first year of college. They've been training for so long that they're, they're, um, you really have to pull a lot of tricks out of the bag in order to elicit an adaptation again. Right. So, um, yeah, linear, linear progression, super basic and, um, and definitely the place to start. And the second thing is, is, um, it's a very broad term, but periodization is what it's called. And, and the general idea is that you're going to, um, you, you're going to go through some f- sort of, of loading phase and progressive overload. And then you're going to back off a little bit and let everything recover. And then you're going to do another massive progressive overload and then some sort of a taper where things become a little bit easier. And then there's this super compensation period where your body was expecting something else to happen. And so it's, um, elicits a, a massive adaptation and then you perform at whatever you're doing. Right. And so the, the, the periodization thing becomes a lot more sports specific or a lot more goal specific and much more complex and, and more entertaining <laughs> and way more entertaining for the coaches. That's for right, sure. Right. Yeah. And in the yeah. context of this program, it, that's kind of how we've handled this. We've, we've approached it in that sense, in that way. Yeah, it's totally. So the, the program itself is seasonally periodized. So we're, we're handling that component of, of the, uh, the, the overall program to keep kind of everybody moving, um, you know, forward at a nice pace. Right. And then as far as the loading specifically goes, we don't give specific loading and, um, we, we, for a couple of reasons, one, because it's, it's, it just is an incredibly difficult thing to do, um, for, for people who have a ton of different, um, a ton of different backgrounds, ton of different lifting experience and, and stuff like that and yeah. implements. Right. So, you know, saying, okay, uh, yeah, we want you to deadlift at 70% of your one rep max today. That's doesn't mean a lot to doesn't a, mean lot a lot, of people, lot, to a lot of people. Yeah, right. exactly. And so what we found is that sort of periodizing the actual program, but then allowing the individuals to, uh, work their way through a linear progression on the loading is is kind of the way to do it and right. and so one of the things we wanted to discuss a little bit was like just some seat of the pants measures to know whether or not the the loading is is working for you right right whether it's time to bump up a little bit right and and so if there's one thing you take away from all of this if the last 10 minutes of this conversation kind of went what way over your head or or you just you know that's not in the spectrum of what you are understanding in terms of of your workouts and and what this is all about. Don't worry about it. The only thing you really need to take away from it is that we've handled it already for you. You just need to notice if you're getting through the work, you're getting through the set and rep scheme and you're managing it, but it's tough. 
if you're right at that kind of place where it's like, this is tough, but I can do it, then you're in a sweet spot and you want to try to stay there as you progress over the week. So at some point, if you go, hmm, that workout was really easy today, it was, wasn't even like I worked out actually, <laughs> then you know it's time to start increasing the loading. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that, so using that 10 pounds for a lower body movement, and five pounds for an upper body movement is, is just a pretty good way to go, you know? So if you've, you know, the last two times you've hit, uh, you're pressing, it's been super easy. The next time pressing comes around, you know, throw five pounds on there. Right. And then, and, and then conversely, if you're, if you're training and, you know, everybody has really good days sometimes and, and you, well, God knows what the combination was, good night's sleep, whatever the thing is. And you go to the gym and you just nail your workout. And then the next week you come in and you're not having such a great day. Don't be, you know, discouraged that that's going to be something that happens. And, you know, every now and then you may just have to back off five pounds, give it another week and then, and try it again. Absolutely. And, and with that said, this kind of comes back to when you're building your arsenal of implements, you know, that's why a lot of times Adam and I will recommend kettlebells right out the gate because you can get sort of, you know, two or three kettlebells and you can progress through the kettlebells. Whereas the first, you know, the heaviest weights were for squatting eventually you'll start swinging them or you'll start pressing them and you can kind of progress upwards. Next up would definitely be a barbell and free weights because obviously you're going to have the most control over things with that setup. Yeah, totally. And, and, and actually I just answered a question in the feed today about that. And uh, specifically it was like, uh, should I, should I go with more kettlebells or should I jump into uh, a, a barbell setup? And, um, I mean, I would love it if everybody had a, you know, an, full blown garage gym, you know, with the Olympic lifting platform and on full set of kettlebells and all that. But the, the advice that, that I gave in the feed was that if you, if you have access to a squat rack, um, where you can, you know, rack a barbell to squat and you can rack a barbell for standing press, then the barbell becomes a pretty good alternative if you already have, or not alternative, but a pretty good way to go. If you, if you have a few free weights, or I'm sorry, a few dumbbells or a few kettlebells, then a barbell is awesome. If you have access to a squat rack, um, if you don't have access to a squat rack, then the barbell becomes fairly limited because now you're looking at Olympic lifts and deadlifts. Everything you're going to do is going to start from the ground right. that is going to, um, you know, have any significant sort of loading. So if you don't have access to a squat rack and you don't intend to kind of go that deep, then I think that upping the weights and upping the availability of your kettlebell or dumbbell selection is probably a better call at that point. Absolutely. And honestly, the kettlebells are great. You know, you can have, even if you, you just add one or two at a time to your arsenal, even if you end up with 10 kettlebells at some point, you could really do everything you need to do forever and ever. Amen. With that amount of kettlebells. So, you know, it, it may seem like, okay, am I missing the boat here? But they really are a utilitarian piece of equipment. Yeah. Yeah. The And, I, you know, I for a long time, I was actually pretty anti-kettlebell because I saw a lot of people ending up with wrist, elbow, and shoulder injuries from um, from misusing them. And so I've always kind of been, uh, you know, a little bit more of an advocate of the barbell and the dumbbell. But recently, I have to say, I've sort of changed my mind about that. And a lot of it has to do more with the kind of exercises that are being prescribed with the kettlebell. Right. So you don't necessarily need to be doing kettlebell cleans, kettlebell snatches and these a little bit more and Turkish get ups and stuff that are, you know, technically more challenging. And this is where the people are typically getting injured. You can do very basic movements like what we're doing here with a swing, um, uh, you know, a racked front squat, a goblet squat, uh, farmer's walk, stuff like that with the with the kettlebell. And it becomes actually an incredible tool from that perspective. So I'm. I don't know. I lean a little bit more toward the kettlebell now, uh, although I do think that 99% of the things that we're going to be doing in this program can be done with a kettlebell or a dumbbell. So feel free to, you know, to to intermix those. Yeah. If you have, if you have a 50 pound kettlebell, if you have a 50 (laughs) pound pound dumbbell, you probably don't need a 50 pound kettlebell, you know? Um, But anyway, probably enough blabbing about that. You can get a lot done with a, you know, uh, get my kilos screwed up, a 16, a 20 and a 24. Uh, and then, you know, if you're a big, if you're a big and then a 30 kilo, um, definitely, yeah, goes a long way. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, especially for women out there that are, you know, I, I think most of the people in our community are pretty comfortable overall with the weightlifting aspect of it. And I haven't seen a lot of commentary about, you know, shying away from weight. But I know that this is a common theme, particularly amongst women is, you know, just being afraid of adding too much weight, not wanting to get bulky, you know, just being sort of not as comfortable with lifting weights and and that periodization and that linear progression, adding weight every week. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that this week because, you know, for one, Forever and ever, people told me, you know, you can't get bulky. It's not possible. You're a woman. You don't have the genetics for it. You don't have the hormonal predisposition, all of those things. And I actually, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that 100%. I think that some people put on muscle more easily than others. And, you know, that applies to women as well. I'm particularly one of those people that does put on muscle pretty easily. So if you know that you're someone who tends to bulk up pretty easily, that happens. It's totally a real thing. But you just want to balance it out. You want to find a sweet spot where you can have a little bit of muscle mass that can support your organ function, that can help you maintain a good body composition, that can help you burn fat easier. You want to have a little bit extra muscle, especially going into your older years, because It's harder to put on as you get older, for sure. And if you have a little extra mass, it's going to serve you long term. So don't don't be afraid. You know, I, I don't like that people say you can't put on muscle as a woman or you can't get bulky. That really irritates me because that's. That's just simply not true. You can. (laughs) Yeah, there's yeah, there is this thing of, you know, um, Chicks don't want to lift because they get bulky. And there's all these memes out there now, these like ripped, you know, but lean and relatively small girls deadlifting a bunch of weight. And you're like, right. And then there's also, you know, these girls that are the top tier competitors at the CrossFit Games that have more significant muscle mass than I do. Yes, you know, like exactly. Dramatically more <laughs> muscle than I do, you know. So, yes, you can, man. You can get some big old traps. You <laughs> for can. For sure. You Absolutely. Know? And and so, like, let's just be real. Each of us have a different body, a different body composition, and a different propensity for putting on muscle. And yeah. it's all good. So, it's just about knowing what your body type is. And, you know, if you're a hard gainer, if it's tough to gain muscle mass and it's going to take a little bit more effort in your lifetime to, yeah. to keep that muscle mass and you do want some muscle mass. It's like, I mean, trust me, as you get older, it is harder to get that muscle mass and it is so important for yeah, your health and to, longevity. To maintain it. Yeah. And then if you're, you know, if you're a, a, um, mesoectomorph like Vanessa who who just <laughs> who stacks on muscle like crazy then um then she knows that and her training program reflects it absolutely you know it's it's uh very heavy repetitions very very low um number of reps so I should say you know heavy weight low number of reps only a couple of times a week you know yes. it's very super super low volume you know where uh, that may not actually work for somebody who doesn't put on muscle mass very well. You know? Absolutely. And I also think it's important to, you know, for someone like me and others out there that do put on muscle easily to say, okay, well, on one hand, yeah, maybe maybe it's hard to find shirts where my arms fit in as easily or whatever, <laughs> but I love to be fit and I love to work out and I love to surf and I love to be active and that's the most important thing for me at the end of the day is health and fitness and fun. Yeah. Being able to support the lifestyle. And then, yes. and I mean, especially for women, we just can't, you know, the, the muscle mass component of it is, is just a small part, right? I mean, like Vanessa was saying, we do need that. Um, we do need the, the, the increased muscle mass for metabolism and for all of that stuff. But when you lift, especially when you lift he- heavy, you also increase your bone density, you know, and, and osteoporosis is Absolutely. a real problem, right? So, um, doing something that challenges your hip structure, uh, is a really good thing to do moving forward. So that's, we yeah. kind of beat this one around in circles for a while here. We but. did, but it's important because I think that there's a lot, there's sort of two sides of the fence out there. There's either the girls who are like, I don't lift and I only do yoga and this is my thing. Or the girls who are like, I don't care. I want to 
put on muscle and I want to do CrossFit. And it's like there's a whole spectrum out there of people in the middle. And, I, you know, I just kind of want to shed some light on the fact that there is that you can maintain a different spectrum. You can be anywhere that you want to be. It's just important to learn and grow in your practice so that you learn how to maintain it and achieve the body type that supports your health and longevity and hopefully comes up with an aesthetic that you're happy to be in as well. Yeah, totally. And so I, I think that th- this program is fit in a pretty nice, um, happy medium from a volume perspective. So I think uh, hard gainers, you're going to have to eat a lot, but you'll be able to put on some weight doing this, you know, yeah. if that's what you're trying to do. And um, folks like Vanessa who are just are just piling on the muscle. Um, <laughs> just like a Popeye over here. Popeye. <laughs> can you eating, guys, eating can you picture me just... now just basically bulging out of my shirt? <laughs> yeah, then... Um, it's actually pretty easy to reduce volume just a little bit with this program. And if, if that becomes a concern for any of you, uh, it's a super easy fix. So yes. just hit us up. We can, we can make some pretty easy recommendations for that. Absolutely. But bottom line takeaway from this whole podcast, once again, is just know that if you're getting through the workouts and they're challenging, each set and rep scheme is challenging, but you're getting through it, you're in a, you're in a sweet spot. So as soon as you start breezing through things and it's like you didn't even do a workout, that's kind of the light bulb that you need to up your game a little bit. You need to add a little bit more weight. Yeah, totally. And one thing that, um, because I, I just naturally, I have like large lung volume. I have a high VO2 max naturally. So I don't like conditioning is, is very seldom like really a problem for me. So with weightlifting and things like that, I don't, it's tough for me to get winded, but I'll tell you what is the best indicator for me when things are hard is my blood pressure. Like if I, I mean, deadlifting and stuff, you'll get dizzy, you know, if it's heavy enough. Um, but if I hit, especially with the kettlebell stuff, like doing the program that we're doing now, where you're doing these giant sets and stuff like that, my blood pressure will go through the roof and to the point that like I can feel it pounding out the side of my, my neck. You know, I'm not really winded, but my blood pressure is way, way up. So for those of you who have a big cardio engine and you're looking for some way to tell whether or not you're really eliciting a good muscular response, um, that's one way to look at it, right? So when you are when you uh, recruit a ton of muscle, it is a vasoconstrictor and it increases your blood pressure. So just another meter. Yes, absolutely. Hopefully this was more informative than confusing. (laughs) (laughs) We know know whenever we tackle this kind of subject matter, it's going to bring up, you know, 10 more questions. But part of our goal is to help you guys educate yourselves and to find the happy medium that works for you. And we know that sometimes we were sort of poking the lion here by throwing this information out there because then, you know, a lot of times people get more confused or whatever. But that's just part of the game and we'll yeah. just keep answering questions and we'll keep learning as time goes on. Yeah, totally. So the more times we confuse you and then get to <laughs> like redirect the better. Oh, actually I know there was another question and this is, um, this come up a couple of times with regard to the smashing because we've been doing a ton of smashing. And so some folks are starting to get some bruising and, right. and just kind of some, um, you know, some hot spots, so to speak from the amount of smashing and stuff we've been doing. So the, the, the rule of thumb for you know all of this mobility stuff is that if it feels sketchy it's sketchy and if damaged tissue like if you're if you have a contusion like if you have actual bruising if you have swelling um, localized to the areas that you're smashing just just give it a break or switch out to a a foam roller or like a basketball or something really big that you can just you're where you're just literally going to be pushing the mass of tissue around and um and, and then maybe just take it a little easier. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and with the spinal column too, you can always take, you know, the, the balls to the wall and just roll kind yeah. of up and down gently. It, it doesn't have to be maximum pressure and torture yeah. every time. Yeah. You want to avoid the pain cave. Yes. You know, it's like you you should be able to, um, I mean, you, maybe a smile might be overkill, you know, <laughs> but you should at least be able to have a relaxed face while you're doing this stuff. And if you, 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 if you shouldn't can't, be then, like on a, on a scale of one to 10, you shouldn't be at a 12. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or even an eight probably. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it should be, you should like, but honestly it is a good measure. You should be able to have a relaxed face. Right. If you're, if you're in a forced grimace, um, it's probably too gnarly. Yeah. Agreed. So, uh, let's see here. Oh, one last question we had 
Someone asked about the various chakras or the energy centers that I talk about during the meditations. And, uh, you know, they mentioned that they were new to meditation and that chakras were a new term to them. And I actually won't be doing a bunch on chakras today, but I did do an interview with my mom who teaches classes on energy work chakras. She's kind of my my little guiding light and someone who's taught me a lot about this stuff. So her and I did an entire podcast on the chakras and we'll be publishing that probably in the off week. So yeah. you guys will, if you want to listen to that, that could be something interesting for you to tune into and learn more about the energy work. Yeah. Oh, we didn't even talk about Coachella. Oh yeah. We went to Coachella. Yeah. Weekend week. one down. Weekend one down. Weekend two coming up. Yes. ACDC was awesome. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Those guys are, uh, well, they're rock stars. They're real rock stars. They're, they're old. Like, and they don't, I mean, they don't look good. Nope. You know, I mean, they like, they look like they've been doing this since 1973. Yep. But they just killed it. They killed it. Was it was awesome. Yeah. They did a great job. Florence and, and the Machine, absolutely amazing. Amazing. Alabama it, Shakes. Alabama Shakes. Were yep. incredible. Jack White. Jack White. From the White yeah. Stripes was amazing. Yep. Good, good, good music. Yes, Coachella is the festival for music lovers, so it's really cool because there are literally all types of music, and you can go from, you know, ACDC to, you know... An Steely a, Dan. Steely Dan, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that we saw Steely Dan, too. That, yeah. was a, that was a trip. They were great. I mean, they were, they were great, and for Steely Dan, Adam and I were not big fans. We apologize if that insults people to... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. to the core of their souls but you know they're talented incredibly talented musicians and we had actually like front row seats but the coolest part of steely dan was looking up and seeing paul mccartney on one side of the stage and clint eastwood on the other side of the yeah. stage rocking out <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Just, you know you're you're somebody when clint eastwood and, and uh, paul mccartney are on stage jamming with you yeah so, absolutely cool. so anyhow we had an, a fantastic time and we're headed out to weekend two, so we'll let you guys know next weekend who we saw and, and what great shows uh, we went to this weekend. Yeah, if you okay. care. If you care. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can or always, you could just tell us you to You can shut always up. fast forward. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, have a great last week. This is our final week. I can't believe it, right? We're going into week three. Yeah. And uh, and we will see you next week. Have a great weekend. All right, folks. Bye. Bye.
to say goodbye.